It is my distinguished pleasure to announce and introduce to you the chair of National Geographic Society, CEO of Case Foundation, as well as the author of Be Fearless, Jean Case. If you added up all the times you failed, and all the times you came up short, would you try again? What if failure wasn't a limitation? What if taking risks was your status quo? What kind of world would you imagine? When the challenges we face seem overwhelming, we need to experiment with new thinking and try new things, create unlikely partnerships, and set audacious goals. To build a better world, to make a real difference, we have to take bigger risks, make bigger bets. And if we fail, and fail again, we have to get right back up and dream even bigger. To live in a world worth living in, we have to let challenge inspire us. We have to take risks, be bold, and let urgency conquer fear. We have to be fearless. And moderating what's going to be an incredible discussion is another Mel. Managing partner of We Family Office and a dear friend, Mel Lagomasino. Wow, it's a big stage. I'm going to come closer to you. You on the sofa together? Why don't we do that? <laughs> yeah, better this way. Okay. So, hi, everybody. And, um, and the idea is to have a great conversation with Jean. And when I saw that we were in the women innovation and technology stage, I thought, well, my God, this is Jean. This is really, she's a personification of all three of those uh, things. And when you think about all the businesses out there that we've been listening to and that have been uh, presenting uh, today, all those businesses are built on the internet, which we take for granted. But Jean, you and Steve actually laid the pipes, laid the foundation for us all to be connected at AOL. You were the real pioneers, you were the real beginning, right? So tell us about that journey. Sure. Well, good morning, everyone. And I have to say, it's one of those rare moments for me where I really could be moderating the conversation today with my friend Mel. It could easily be the other way around. So I did have the privilege of being in technology in very early days. This will clearly date me. Uh, but I actually started with the first online service in the nation. It was called The Source, and that was 1983. All text, no pictures, no graphics. <laughs> 300 baud, which meant it would take 40 hours to download one song, but nobody was downloading songs then. But I did end up at AOL in the earliest days, and at its peak, of course, AOL carried 50% of the nation's internet traffic. What's often lost, though, as we kind of look at tech today, and we're talking a lot about the challenges of technology, is that those who were into that sort of first wave of the internet, really trying to build it and create a revolution, you know, we believed we were there to democratize access to ideas and information and communication. And I think we found success doing that, ultimately bringing it to the mainstream. But just at AOL alone, we used to say we were a 10-year overnight sensation because it was a good decade before anyone had heard of us or really knew what we were doing back then. What was the biggest challenge? And you think about it, you were the chief marketing officer yeah. for AOL. Right. And nobody was going to download us, take 40 hours to download us. Correct. A song. <laughs> of course, thankfully, by the time AOL came along, the speeds were much faster. We did have graphics, we did have all kinds of capabilities. But the biggest challenge, oddly, I was chief of marketing, and I would have to sit every morning with the chief of networking because there wasn't enough network capacity in the nation to take the number of people that wanted to join our service, believe it or not. So I would have to modulate my marketing efforts to basically make sure I didn't you know, overflow the pipes, if you will. So it took quite a while for the network capacity in our nation to catch up with consumer demand for the internet. But ultimately it did, and of course the rest is history. It sure is, and we're all benefiting from it. And so when you think about, you were quite fearless in terms of what you did. What made you write 
Be Fearless. So I, I do have this book, Be Fearless, which uh, was spotlighted earlier. And the subhead of it is five principles for a life of breakthroughs and purpose. And really, I've had this um, unusual situation where I've had a couple of different waves of my own career. So yes, I spent about two decades in technology. Then when I retired from that, my husband and I uh, co-founded the Case Foundation, our family foundation, where I've served as its CEO since its founding. And then along the way, I got deeply engaged in the work of National Geographic, where I serve as chair today. So from all of that, it took me traveling both around the nation and around the world to some of the most remote and smallest villages you can imagine to the biggest cities. Um, and you know what I would notice is everywhere I would go, people would have really great ideas, great ideas about how to make their world or their community a better place. But often they would get stuck. I'd say, well, wow, that is like a terrific idea. What have you done with that? Oh, well, I. I can't do that. No, that, that's, that's not me. And it would always kind of, it would sort of dog me. Why do some people break through and others don't? So about seven years ago, we commissioned some research at the Case Foundation to look at the core qualities of successful innovators, change makers, and entrepreneurs. And what we found were these simple five principles that I write about in the book. But more importantly, and honestly cooler for us, we thought, was that we were able to debunk a myth that exists in a lot of people's heads, that it takes some special quality, either that you're born with, or going to the right school, or living in just this right place. Everybody has a different narrative of why it isn't me. And we could clearly point out that of the most extraordinary stories out there, it's actually ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And the book is written to tell those stories, to take you behind the scenes of successful stories, not only people you know, but many, many you don't, across sectors and across geographies as well. Yeah, you have great stories. Thank you. All kinds. It's really fun to write. I got to, to live in these stories for some number of weeks. I went away to the hometown I was born in, a small town called Normal. Normal Illinois, um, and wrote the book for a few weeks. And it just was almost like a high to just get up every day and be able to focus on these incredible and inspirational stories. And you've made your inspirational stories and your own story has made such an impact. I was telling Jean right before we came on stage that we do a book club at our, at our company. And the book I chose uh, to, to lead with was this book. And we had a series of people around the table and two individuals, after reading the book, one said to me, uh, I, I really now have started helping the homeless on the weekends because I really think that I can do something different. And the other was a, a young woman who actually is only out of Cuba for three years. And she said, I have spent all of these three years trying to fit in and figure out how I help my family, et cetera. And I realized it's not enough. I've read this book, and I want to go help other people that are in this situation. And these are two, you know, as you say, normal people who all of a sudden get inspired to do something completely outside of them to make the world a better place. And, you know, one of the principles, I'll run through the five principles very quickly, and I want to highlight one particularly here at Emerge. The first is make a big bet. And you know that's no surprise, right? Transformational change happens when you have a big idea. Now, how you're going to get there is through smaller incremental steps, but the idea itself has to truly be a big bet. The next is take risks, be bold. Not surprisingly, if you're out there on the front lines of something that's unproven, you're by its very nature taking risks. So risk taking is an incredible part of breaking through. Following risk taking is the third principle, make failure matter. Just like, you know, it makes total sense that you gotta take risks to try something new. When you're out there taking risks and trying something new, chances are you're not gonna hit it out of the park all the time. You will have failures along the way. Make failure matter really teaches us to let failure be a teacher, to apply the lessons of what we've learned. And when we think about that in terms of R&D, we understand that all the time in medicine and science. It's actually the failures in the labs that teach them where they need to go and what needs to be perfected and when to make a left or a right turn. We need to apply that same thinking as we build our ideas forward. Um, the next is reach beyond your bubble. I'm going to go into that in just a minute. And last is let urgency conquer fear. And you know, Mel, Martin Luther King called it 
the fierce urgency of now. It's a powerful motivator to get people out of their comfort zones to really help them dig deep, find the courage to try some things in normal course and speed they might not otherwise want to try. But what I thought would be good to talk about a little bit is this reach beyond your bubble because we are here at Emerge and particularly we're here at Women Innovation and Technology. Reach Beyond Your Bubble was a surprising principle that came out of our um, research. The others were not so surprising. And what that is, is that recognizes that it's actually diverse teams that break through. In America, particularly, we get caught up in this myth that it's like the lone genius in a garage that does something extraordinary. That's not the way history records it at all. And I make this clear time after time from Thomas Edison on down in my book. Um, you know, diverse teams coming together can bring different perspectives to the table. We can cover each other's blind spots because you'll see something I can't see that I need to avoid, maybe. Um, and we say almost broaden your aperture as you come at a problem or an opportunity. And you know, the inclusive messages coming out of Emerge could not be any more important or any more timely because there's an urgent need, not just in this nation, but around the world, to get all the players on the field and all the ideas on the field. But today, particularly in technology, too much of the capital, last year only 2% of venture capital went to women. 2%, it's 2019. We need all the players of all colors, of all backgrounds, from all players, bringing their best ideas forward and, and getting on the field. And it's those diverse teams, whether it's McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Deloitte, there's overwhelming compelling evidence that diverse teams outperform traditional non-diverse teams, both in financial performance, in innovation, and in open to change. But it's so easy to stay in your own bubble because we're all comfortable yeah, we in our are. own bubbles. So what do you do to get out of your own bubble? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do a lot of things. In, in our own team at the Case Foundation, I try to make sure it's a diverse team. I specifically seek out people who are different than I am and different from the others on the team, and I always have. Um, one uh, young man who worked for me for a number of years really became sort of my right arm at the foundation was a black gay man. And um, you know, it was really remarkable working shoulder to shoulder with him for so many years because I saw through a lens I would not have seen had he not been by my side in many circumstances. But the same is true of a lot of people that I've worked with, whether it be you know, at the Case Foundation, at National Geographic, you name it, that you know, when people come together who look at things different, it's actually more fun, more interesting, and as I said, a much more productive way to go forward if you're taking forward an idea. So, you know, um, we think about, about the fact that there are a lot of new companies starting and there are a lot of new technology companies starting, but frankly, there's less small businesses today uh, being started today than there have been in the past. So what advice would you give and uh, to budding entrepreneurs, which I'm sure we have a bunch of in yeah. this room, but and especially, Jean, if you could actually sort of underline to women entrepreneurs that may be in this, in this room, so entrepreneurs in general, but I, I think to women entrepreneurs to encourage them. Yeah, I'd like to underscore what you said, and it's not well understood. We're at a 40-year low in startups in America. And startups have been the economic engine that has propelled our economy. We should all be concerned about this. It's part of the reason there's a clarion call in the book. If you have an idea, take it forward. And if you're here, chances are you've already started something, which is why you're in the room. But you know, risk taking doesn't stop when you start the company. You know, we live in a time of amazing change and transformation. The need to constantly take new risks. I have a chapter in there called peek around corners to look at what's coming and when you need to adapt or even disrupt yourself and your own idea. But most importantly, the opening chapter of the book is called Start Right Where You Are. And maybe you're out there and you work for a company but you've thought about your own thing or maybe you've started something but you have a really big bet you've thought about taking and you're not sure. 
The whole idea of start right where you are is bring whatever you have to just get started with that today. It's actually the starting point of either taking a bigger risk if you've started something or just to begin to start something. Um, but time and time again, making sure that each week, each day, each month, you're doing what you can to advance the idea. And I know at one level it sounds so duh, but sometimes it's much simpler than you think it is. It's writing that email that you've been a little nervous about sending. It's maybe ringing someone and saying, can we do coffee this week? Who out there, no matter your circumstance, can take you further and faster than you feel you can get right now? And what can you do this week, this month, to basically push that forward? It's just so needed. And to the women specifically, I want to say, if you listen to what I just said about where the data is going, you could be the secret sauce to a breakthrough. It's not to say that men on their own can't. They have, and they've proven that for hundreds of years, their talents at that. But what we find is when diverse teams and unique perspectives come to the table, there's outsized performance. So you know, I try to use that as a motivator. I'm still in too many rooms where I'm the only female executive at the table. And I try to remind myself, I could be the special sauce today to really help this team break through. Just use it as a, as a motivator in those moments when it might feel like, ugh, I'm feeling a little awkward here. And Jean is the first woman chair of the National Geographic Society. And I was a trustee of the National Geographic Society when we were thinking about a new chair. And it was so clear to everybody in the room that you were the right one and you could take it to the next level. And we had to make a very big bet. Thank you. Not on you. Well, we had to make a very big bet in terms of what we did with National Geographic. Do you want to tell that story? It was a big bet whenever you name a new chairman. Oh, you mean our new, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Not <laughs> so, you. We knew, we, that, was not, that was an easy bet. Uh, this comes from a woman, by the way, who serves on both the Coke and the Disney board, as Mel does. So she knows what she's talking about when she talks about boards. Um, so what Mel is talking about is, yes, we are a 131-year-old nonprofit. And we've always said we believe in the power of science exploration and storytelling to change the world. But we had this long-standing venture with 21st Century Fox to deliver the National Geographic channels, and it had gone really well. And Mel did have long service on our board, and we were so grateful. Um, but Fox approached us and said, we'd like to expand it and have all of your commercial businesses put into the venture. So we had a series of offsites and strategic meetings to take a look at whether we should expand the venture. Long story short, we did. It created for National Geographic ultimately a $1.2 billion endowment and about $100 million a year that comes over the transom in revenues that we share for that venture. So highly self-sustaining, which is a little unusual for a nonprofit organization. But the really big exciting news, which brings Mel and I back together a little bit too, is that Disney has just acquired 21st Century Fox, so now Disney is our new partner. Now, there is kind of a bit of a funny story about National Geographic that goes way back, and it goes to risk-taking. So about 100 years ago, the new technology technology was photography. We forget that, but it was a new tech, believe it or not, and consumers were just starting to learn about it. But it was mostly professional organizations that were engaged because things were still kind of expensive at that time. So the National Geographic editor comes into the board and says, you know, the, the, the magazine was a very serious scientific journal, and says, I want to put photographs in to support our articles. Well, the board was having none of it. You know, photography is a new fad. That's not serious science. It became quite a thing at that board meeting, and it's well recorded in our minutes. Well, it turns out, ultimately, he brought the board along, but two board members resigned because of the board's decision to allow photography. <laughs> now, let me tell you, 131 years later, two things happened in the last month that we're excited about. We became the first brand in the world to pass 100 million Instagram followers, so the photography thing wow. worked pretty well. And then we just won an Oscar for our uh, documentary, Free Solo. If you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic documentary, but it'll keep you on the edge of your seat. It will, yes, definitely. I wore a heart monitor when yeah. I watched it. It had effect. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic, your whole, your whole trajectory and the ins how inspirational it really has been. And I would urge everybody to read the book if you haven't done so already and hear these incredible stories. And you have fantastic quotes in there, too. Uh, one of my favorite quotes was when Thomas Edison 
was asked, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but it was something like, he was asked uh, how he had, what, if he had listened to what customers wanted, what would he have done? And he said, well, what customers really wanted was faster horses. Right. Um, so sometimes the people that you're trying to solve for don't necessarily know what you want. You have to be the one that peeks around the corner and right. tries to figure out what the future is, just like this editor at National Geographic. That's right, that's right. And I think we see that in all transformational sort of breakthroughs, is that the person that had the idea just actually can see a different way forward, a different future. And you know, I used to say my head is kind of flat from all those years people would go like that. And when we would talk about a connected world, a world in which you know, people might actually you know, use technology devices to communicate and be in touch with each other, you sometimes have to see a different future and have the perseverance to stand in there when people think you're a little bit crazy. It's okay to be a little crazy. Yeah. That's the only way we're gonna change the world. That's right. Right. I think we're out of time. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Great to be thank with you. you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Dean.